Sometimes the Buddha is accused of saying that all change is bad. And sometimes he's accused of saying that all change is good. Of course he said neither. When your mind changes for the better, that's a good thing. When it changes for the worse, that's something to watch out for. As he did say, the mind changes so quickly that he couldn't think of a good analogy for how quick it is. There's nothing else in the world that can change in reverse direction as quickly as the mind. This is why we need a lot of mindfulness. We set ourselves on the task of getting the mind to settle down, be still, and it can flip around very easily. This is why concentration has to depend on mindfulness, and mindfulness has to depend on right effort, learning how to recognize an unskillful state when it comes, and then being able to remind yourself, well, what do I do with this? so I don't give in to it. The same with recognizing a skillful state. You have to remember, what do I do with this so that I can maintain it? So this kind of change is the kind of change you have to watch out for. The change that can turn your concentration into something else, or that can turn your practice into something else. So we bolster our, our mindfulness with some discernment, reminding ourselves of why we want to be on this path. I was talking with someone this morning who was saying he tried not to think very much during his meditation, and yet then he came across the Buddhist teachings and what they call analysis of qualities. And as I said to him, you really do have to think about that sometimes. After a while, as you get more used to the ins and outs of your mind, and you can recognize a particular unskillful state as it's just beginning, it's a lot easier to deal with it without a lot of thinking. But in the beginning, it's very easy to find yourself in a, in a real funk, in a very bad state of mind. And it takes a lot of thinking to get yourself out of it, a lot of negotiation. We talked today a little bit about different negotiating strategies. But you have to be able to think them up, because sometimes the strategy that worked yesterday when you were stern with the mind is not going to work today. Or when you were being kind and gentle with the mind, it, sometimes the defilements take advantage of that. The right effort in that case is keeping at it trying to figure out what's going wrong. And sometimes it involves sitting back and saying, okay, I'm going to watch this for a while and see where it's coming from, where it's going, the state in the mind. Then when you can catch something about it, why you fell for it, what you found attractive, and see that it really isn't worth that. Then you can let it go. And then you've got something you can remember, a new technique, a new tool, a new realization that can be part of your arsenal as you deal with unskillful skates the next time they come up. So when there's a problem in the mind, don't be afraid to think it through. If you note it, sometimes it will just go away by the fact that you're noting, oh, there's a, there's a hindrance. There's an unskillful state. Otherwise, other times it's not going to go away. And you want to make sure that you haven't run out of options, i.e. by having only one option. Sometimes we have to sit back and think. Why would I want to think this thought? Why would I want to go down this emotion? Why would I want to have this fantasy? What do I think I'm getting out of it? And sometimes there's the immediate visceral pleasure, and the mind is feeling starved of pleasure. That's when you say, well, I can offer it something else. I can breathe more comfortably, or I can relax different parts of the body. 
relax the back of your hands. Think of the sense of ease, then going up your arms. See, okay, here's a visceral pleasure. What else do you need? And the mind will think up something else. Okay, you have to be able to be on top of it. Because it's not the case that a defilement is going to go away simply because you notice it. It's not like a child with his hand in the cookie jar, knowing that he shouldn't be there, and as soon as the mother comes in, pulls his hand out of the jar. Some defilements are like wild animals. They've got their space and they're going to defend it. So you need a variety of tricks, a variety of tools, a variety of strategies. A similar principle applies with once you've got something skillful going in the mind, how do you maintain it? How do you not lose interest? How do you not get complacent? Complacency is one of the biggest dangers that you can have as a meditator. Things are going well, and you think, well, I don't have to do anything right now. Then you can just watch it, state of mind, disintegrate in front of your eyes. You have to maintain it. You have to have a sense of heedfulness. This could be attacked at any time, so I've got to be still and at the same time a little bit wary to protect that state of mind. As these are cases where you want to prevent change. Something good is going on and you've got to learn how to maintain it. When the Buddha defined mindfulness, he didn't define it as simply accepting what arises and passes away. He said, you realize there are skillful qualities in the mind that need to be developed, and you are mindful to develop them. Once they're there, you're mindful to maintain them. So these are the things that you make arise and you prevent from passing away. That's with the change that the Buddha described when he was talking about inconstancy. That has more to do with where we try to find our happiness. In this case, if you find something that's good, but it is inconstant, then it's going to lead to disappointment. And that's the case where change is a bad thing. And here you need more discernment to learn how to recognize where you can find something that's at least relatively stable. As you get, for instance, for instance getting the mind to settle down. Where in the body is the best place? best place to focus? What kind of breathing is best? How you can get the mind to be happy to settle down and be still? Because the well-being that comes from a still mind is a lot more rewarding and a lot more blameless than any other pleasure you could look for, that you could put together. It's going to require work. And here again, you're fighting against inconstancy. But at least this particular activity has much greater potential for stability, well-being, than the ordinary places where the mind tends to look for its pleasure. So even though it requires work and you see all too clearly that your concentration is inconstant, that doesn't mean you just give it up and say, well, that's my insight, concentration is inconstant. You've got to fight it. It's like that Zen master. I had a student who met Minneapolis, I think it was, and the student was going to come out to Hollywood to make a career. And the Zen master said, well, what if they knock you down? And the student, thinking he should try to sound very Zen, he said, well, I'll just learn how to accept it. And the master said, no, if they knock you down, you get back up. If they knock you down again, you get back up again. You don't give up. So even though the inconstancy of your concentration may knock you down, you don't just accept it. You get back up again and try to figure out what can you do to make it more stable. So even though it seems unstable and inconstant in the beginning, as I said, it does have greater potential than the pleasures you can find in thinking about things, imagining things, fantasizing about things. So even though the concentration seems inconstant to begin with, work at it. 
because it does work in the direction of getting greater stability as you get more used to being here. And you realize that this really is your home, the place where you feel stable, the place where you feel secure. So that when other more changeable things come up, you can see them for what they do. And when other changes happen in the mind, you can see them as well. The changes that happen out in the world are not nearly as bad as the changes that can happen in the mind. And you've got to watch out for those. And the more you get to the mind still, the more you can see subtle things going on that you would have missed otherwise. Because it does all come down to the fact that the only true happiness will be found in something that doesn't change, something that doesn't need to be maintained. That's what we're working toward. Something that doesn't need to feed off of anything. The question came up recently, why would anyone want to go to nirvana? And the answer is because nirvana doesn't need to feed, doesn't need to be maintained. Otherwise, in the world, all the good things you get in the world, you have to look after them, and even then they start falling apart. So if you want happiness is secure, you, you aim in this direction. And one way of getting the mind more inclined to see that nirvana really would be a good thing is to get used to getting the mind really still. Not still in a sluggish way, you want to still and alert. Quick to see things. Stillness doesn't mean slowness. You want to be still so you can see subtle things in the mind that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And have a sense that a mind state that doesn't change is a really good thing. We spend so much of our lives jumping around from one thing to the next that we think that that's where the pleasure lies. What's actually happening is we jump onto something and it gets unpleasant, so we find pl pleasure by jumping away. And so the, this habit of jumping around is many, <clears throat> many people's idea of happiness. But just basically jumping from one hot spot in the frying pan to another hot spot in the frying pan. Here the Buddha is offering something that's outside of the frying pan, where you don't have to jump. And for many of us that's a strange thing when sitting down and just being very, very still. But give the mind a chance to get used to it and you begin to realize that the Buddha said there is really no pleasure other than peace. There's a little bit of pleasure. As the Buddha said, the, the, the pleasure, pleasant part of pain is when it changes from pain. The painful part of pleasure is when it changes. So we're looking for a pleasure that doesn't change. And you don't have to run away from pain. You found something better that doesn't change. That's what we're looking for. So it requires that the mind change its habits and gets more and more used to being at home with being still, and not feeling like it's missing out on anything. Working with the breath and your concentration helps you to realize that, yes, a great deal of pleasure can be found here. But that's just a tool for luring the mind into the present moment. So it gets more and more used to being still, and it's intense stuff ready to jump. So that sense of stillness in the mind does become your home. And you become a homebody, someone who really likes to stay here. That's when the concentration makes a change in the mind. It reaches the point where it's no longer just a technique or a game that you're playing. It's a real reordering of your priorities, a reordering of your values. So you learn how to appreciate how 
good mental stillness can be. You know, a stillness that doesn't require conditions would be even better.